So shalom, gracious, those of you on site, as, uh, also those of you online. How many of you were awakened to the wake service on Good Friday? Yeah? And how, how many of you arose to the resurrection of the Lord on Sunday? Amen? So you don't know, look like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know? So I guess I know where, where you've been uh, last weekend. So I hope today that you are both awake uh, you have risen and you are awake to the fourth sermon on our Judges and Ruth series. So the unlikely choice that we're looking at this morning is the unlikely leader that we find in Jephthah. So this story comes to us from Judges chapter 10 to 12. So thus far, we have heard of Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Barak, and Gideon. These are the judges that God raised uh, to rescue uh, Israel. In today's passage, we read again, once again, of another destructive uh, cycle. They forsook the Lord. In, in chapter 10, verse 6, it says, They forsook the Lord and did not serve Him, but served the gods of Syria, Sidon, Moab, Ammonites, Philistines, plus Baal, or Baals, and Ashtaroth, seven idols named. Every god but Yahweh. So, no price for guessing what happened next. Uh. Yahweh's anger was again kindled against her. And she was sold into the hands of the Philistines and Ammonites who oppressed her for another 18 years. Now, would, would Israel ever learn her lesson? That's our question. And the irony is this, that she knew the reason for her distress. Chapter 10, verse 10 says, that we have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals or the Baals. So how did Yahweh respond? Yahweh said, you know why, right? And yet you blatantly go against me. Therefore, in verse 13, 14, therefore Yahweh said, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. You know, when... What's, what could have started as a mistake, but when you repeat it, it becomes a choice. You know, like your children, right? Like your, they made the first time, it's an honest mistake. Second time, maybe, you know, it's by force of habit. But anything more than two times, it's a deliberate choice you know, to, re, to rebel. And so Israel was not just an occasional covenant breaker. Israel was a patent covenant breaker. But Yahweh was a patient covenant keeper. And so today, our big idea is God desires us to know Him as our covenant keeper. Say covenant keeper. Covenant keeper. Now, that was something uh, Jephthah today, uh, the, 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 uh, the one we're looking at, that was what he failed to do. We see him rise to power and we see also his daughter, this unnamed uh, girl, how she met her tragic end. So God's covenant keeping is seen first in this that God relents even when His own reject Him. God relents even when His own reject Him. You can type in the chat, relents. So Judges 11.1, 1. let's read. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Verse 2. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his sons, uh, wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of uh, Tob. Tob, Tob, okay? but nice name. And, with, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. See, some of us, through no fault of our own, uh, come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And so, and so no matter how uh, we try to prove ourselves, like Jephthah, we can face discrimination from our peers. Now, anyone here has experienced the sting of rejection? Anyone? It hurts, right? It, I mean, really, it, it does hurt. Maybe you were passed over for a job promotion because your superior thought uh, you wouldn't cut it. Or maybe your girlfriend jilted you because her parents didn't think you will make the great year. See, when I was courting my wife, I was still in Bible school. And her parents were right to be concerned, you know. 
as to how I was going to provide for her. I wasn't certain myself, but I'm glad Linda didn't reject me. Why? Because in Christ, we always have a future. Amen? Yeah, but this was not something that Jephthah knew. His family had driven him out. He was an illegitimate son, born of a prostitute. Hence, they made sure that he did not have a share in his father's inheritance or carry, out, carry on his father's uh, lineage. So, what did he do? He banded himself with others also born on the wrong side of town and terrorized his neighborhood. So, you see, Jephthah was an illegitimate son. So, rejection from the rightful heirs was expected. But Yahweh is the initiator of the covenant. He was the covenant keeper of Israel, the legitimate owner. But yet, Israel again and again blatantly rejected him. Uh, but then, an unexpected change of fortune for Jephthah. Let's continue reading. Verse 5. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. Verse 7. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? Verse 8. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over the inhabitants of Gilead. So in desperation, the elders of Gilead sought Jephthah's leadership. Why? Because he was a mighty warrior. That's what the Bible said. That he was a, a pros prostitute's son didn't matter anymore. Right? But not for the first time. In this story, Yahweh was not mentioned as the one who raised the judge. It was not Yahweh. Approaching Jephthah was simply birthed out of human expediency without consulting the Lord. It was a human decision. So as Israel's covenant keeper, Yahweh was always ready to, to deliver who? Deliver Israel under the suzerain and vassal relationship. Now we spoke about this ancient Near East, this form of ancient Near East treaty, eh? the suzerain vassal. In his role, Yahweh as the suzerain, the sovereign uh, ruler, the most superior ruler, he covenanted himself to Israel to defend, to bless her, Israel as the vessel and his servant, you know. But the Gileadites preferred to go to Jephthah for help and were even willing to submit to the condition he placed upon them. Now imagine with me, you've just been retrenched because of, from your company because you were regarded as the, the least valuable member of the team. But overnight, suddenly your particular skill set is, skill set is called for and it has become indispensable. So your company literally begs you, you know, to rejoin them. Any, anybody face something like that? Huh? Now, now, how you respond will show us the moral fiber that you have. You know. So how did Jephthah respond? Ha oh, ha, you know, he said it's payback time, it's payback time. He demanded a guarantee from the elders before agreeing to help them. So verse 9 says, Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. Verse 10, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. See, the elders had no choice but to accede to his terms. Although they didn't want him, but at this moment, they needed him. He was just a pawn in their plan, a means to their end. But Jephthah at the same time also saw a golden opportunity right before him. He had an opportunity to do what? To take his revenge. So he played along knowing that as they desired to use him, so he will also use the situation against them. Was he interested in delivering them? I don't think so. He only agreed to further his own cause. So in this world, we are used to what? We're used to using and being used by people. But let me warn you, don't use God to further your own ends. Don't feign obedience to Him uh, so that you can get Him on your side. Don't only cry out to Him when you need Him. Don't reject Him and His Lordship when you are in a prosperous, safe and secure time. Don't ignore, don't brush Him off when you don't need Him. Don't be like the Gileadites who didn't really want Jephthah but they needed Him for such a time. 
See, friends, our God will not be used. Seek Him at all times. Know that God relents to help us because of who He is. And who is He? He's a God, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. So God relents even when His own rejects Him. The second character of God's covenant keeping we can learn from this story is this, that God is faithful even when His own fail Him. God is faithful. Say faithful. Type in the chat, faithful. God is faithful even when His own fail Him. Judges eleven twenty nine. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to uh, Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. Verse 30, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you give the Ammonites into my hand, verse 31, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Verse 32, So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. So similar to the judges uh, before him, Jephthah was once again endowed with the Spirit of the Lord. That ensured his victory over the Ammonites. But it, in this instance, it seemed that Jephthah was not assured of that. So Jephthah needed a more tangible assurance that the Lord would indeed give them into his hands. So what did he do? I mean, did he think that God... Yahweh could be bought, that God would be impressed with his rash vow and display of reckless love in promising that he would offer whatever as a burnt offering, that Yahweh could be pressed into service. See, Yahweh rescued the Gileadites because he was faithful to his covenant. He could not be coerced to do more or to be moved by Jephthah's sacrifice. The initiative was always Yahweh's alone. So the faith in Yahweh's faithfulness to act was always one of grace and not by our own works. And you see the tragic outcome to Jephthah's foolish and unnecessary vow in uh, chapter 11, verse 34. So as we read, Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah. Remember the vow? And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dancers. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. Verse 35, And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. So of all those in his household who came out to give him a hero's welcome, it had to be his one and only daughter. Now this was not unexpected because she was daddy's girl. She would come out and she was so happy. But alas, he had vowed anything that came out to meet him, he would offer as a burnt offering to the Lord. He was entrapped by his own words. What should have been a day of celebration became a day of mourning. And so you see, Jephthah delivered a nation, but he could not defend his daughter. He flourished as a fighter, but he failed as a father. Not how he was more concerned for his state. He said, you have brought me very low. You have become the cause of great trouble to me, you know. So he was more sorry for his own state rather than the plight he had committed his daughter to. Should not he be sorrowful and sorry for his rash vow than to blame her for his blunder? But listen to the daughter's response. Verse 36. I have, a, I have a daughter, as all of you know. Well, I mean, this, this really caught me off guard. Listen, to, listen to, to her response. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. Verse 37, So she said to her father, Let's, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. Instead of blaming him, she commended her father on his vow to the Lord. Be faithful now to the Lord as the Lord was faithful to you. So she encouraged him to fulfill the vow at her expense. 
totally unlike Jephthah. There was no resistance, no reluctance, full submission, full compliance. What a sad contrast to Israel's persistent rebellion against Yahweh, who had covenanted only to bless and protect her. See, for this girl, even, even though her father's vow was uncalled for and jeopardized her life, yet she fully submitted to him without question. See, no doubt, making a vow is a serious thing before God. You make a vow to God, it's serious, and you need to pay it as soon as possible. So Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 5 tells us this, When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that, than that you should vow and not pay. Wow. Oh, wow. Look at that. So many times, if you vow, you need to pay. But meanwhile, Jephthah had two whole months, right, to figure out how to release his daughter from this vow. Had he been diligent, he would have found out that sacrificing his daughter was against God's law. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10, uh, the Lord said through Moses, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. So it was outlawed. Second thing, the law had an escape clause for similar cases. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, If anyone makes a special vow to the Lord involving the valuation of persons, verse 3, then the valuation of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old shall be 50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Verse 4, If the person is a female, the valuation shall be 30 shekels. So this is for those between 20 to 60 years old. Anyone between, uh, below 21 years old, for the female, it will only be 10 shekels. And if the person was just 6 years and below, it will only be 3 shekels. So the law had an escape clause. If you paid that, you would free the person. He, he, he could have redeemed her from the vow. Just last week, eh, even the 4-4 four, four Shopee spree eh, has a 15-day uh, free returns for your impulsive buys, you know, with no questions asked. For two whole months, you know, he could have figured out, he could have asked somebody, you know, asked the priest, how can I get my daughter out of this, my, out of this vow? You know? Finally, he might have pleaded with God for himself to be sacrificed in place of his daughter. If you're a parent, right, wouldn't you do that? Yeah? Wouldn't you do that? As parents, if we could, we would willingly take the place of our children, whether going through an operation, taking a test, battling sickness, suffering, or paying a fine, you know. We will all do that willingly because we are the parents. But we don't know why Jephthah didn't exercise any of these options. So he let the two months pass by and he did what he vowed. Had he come before God and confessed his error, his daughter's life would be spared. But strangely for him, to keep his word was more important than keeping his daughter alive. If he retracted his vow, it, it would mean that he could no longer justify himself by the strength of his word or his works. It meant that he must rely on God's mercy and pardon. Something that he was not willing and ready to do. So Jephthah would rather be seen as noble, strong and respectable before others. A man of his word. Rather than weak before his God. You see, God's faithfulness does not require our arm-twisting antics. So be careful not to offer sacrifices to buy God's favour. He owes us nothing and is not indebted to us in any way. The opposite is true. We owe Him everything, are completely indebted to Him. I remember praying for the healing of a pre-believer. And in my mind, I mean, he had cancer, but in my mind, I thought that his, his healing would prove that the God I believed was real. So I really seriously, in my earnestness and zeal, I seriously fasted and interceded for Him. So not only did his condition grow worse, to my dismay, he eventually passed on. And then I, I learned something. I know that you cannot bargain with God. You cannot. God is sovereign on his own. Right? Sometimes you say, Lord, I'll give you a million dollars if you help me close this $10 million deal. Uh, okay, maybe 1.2 million. If you want more, 1.5 million. Lord, I'll give you that if you just help me uh, get this deal. We can't. God is faithful to keep His promises not because of what we can give Him, but because He is a covenant 
keeper. Amen? Amen? And in his eyes, our obedience is better than our choice sacrifice. Our choice sacrifice. Jephthah's daughter's simple trust in her father's decision was really a slap in the face for Jephthah, who did not trust Yahweh to be an all-wise and infinitely good covenant keeper. So a necessary tragedy would have been avoided had Jephthah understood the heart of Yahweh. But at the end, Jephthah got what he wanted at the expense of his daughter. What a price to pay. So first we learn that God relents even though we reject Him. And God is faithful even when we fail Him. The third thing we can learn about God's covenant keeping is how God remains steadfast. Steadfast even when our methods are suspect. God remains steadfast. Say steadfast. Now type in the chat, steadfast. God is steadfast. All the Jephthah set to do, set out to do, right? It seemed that it was accomplished. The last verse about him is in chapter 12, verse 7. And it says that he was given the title judge. He was judge. And then he was reinstated as a Gileadite. He died as a Gileadite. So by that estimate, he seemed successful. We find Jephthah and Gideon among those listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 12. But nonetheless, not everything that was recorded about them concerning their lives is meant for us to emulate. Being God's instrument for a particular season and for a specific purpose did not mean that they were perfect and far from, far from it. In fact, Jephthah's methods to obtain God's favour were highly questionable. First, Jephthah regarded Yahweh as one of the pagan gods. Jephthah was a shrewd negotiator. He broke his way up from being an outcast to become the head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. He could do that. He could take advantage of that opportunity. Then he used his diplomacy on the king of the Ammonites in attempting to reason his way out of a bloody confrontation. But the king was not impressed. So a fierce battle ensued. He tried his negotiation skill a third time by boldly making, boldly making a vow to Yahweh. And Jephthah thought that offering up his daughter would prove to Yahweh that he was willing to personally bear an exorbitant sacrifice. So in his warped understanding, Jephthah assumed that Yahweh could be bribed to secure his victory over the Ammonites. Yahweh did grant him victory, but not because of his bargaining skills. God had a bigger reason to deliver Israel. He was her covenant keeper and had vowed to protect her by showing her unmerited favour. Finally, Jephthah paid no regard to Yahweh at all. Judges 12, 1. Then the men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zavon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Verse 4. Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. 7b. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Remember Gideon? Gideon also faced the, Ephraim, uh, the, the Ephraimites. But Gideon was wiser and Gideon was more subdued in his response to the Eph Ephraimites. But not Jephthah. You see, the Ephraimites were fellow Jews. They were fellow Israelites. But for Jephthah, he had no qualms in silencing them and quickly disposing his opposers. So he never regarded God. But as Yahweh's, as Israel's covenant keeper, Yahweh desired mercy and not sacrifice. And as God's judge, Jephthah should have known better. You see, according to one Bible scholar, in killing the 42,000 Ephraimites, right, Jephthah killed more than all of Israel's enemies put together by the other judges. He killed his own people more than all the enemies that were killed by the other judges. In the end, as one commentator noted, Jephthah is remembered not as Israel's most heroic and brilliant leader, but a brilliant judge, but as the most heartless and barbaric of all Israel's judges. See, when our moral compass is off and when God is not in the center, our decisions can go awry. Sometimes we get it right, but sometimes we assume we got it right because we had the right method or the right formula. So Jephthah, in misunderstanding 
the covenant-keeping nature of Yahweh not only made uh, the serious error of relating to him as one of the other gods, but then he acted contrary to Yahweh's character. See, when God chooses a servant, it is not because he or she is perfect. If that were the case, then no one would be able to fit the bill. But it is in keeping with God's mercy that he invites us to partner with him. So be careful not to become the heroes in our own stories instead of attributing everything that is good and perfect to God, our covenant keeper. He allows our imperfections as long as we know it's about Him and not about us. Amen? Military might, political power, winsome skills do not ensure godly character and godly choices. What determines godly decisions is godly wisdom. And the beginning of wisdom is... What's the beginning of wisdom? Go through GDI classes? Nah, it's more than that. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. See, although he was initially rejected, Jephthah was offered the opportunity to salvage his social standing and strengthen his position of influence. But he failed to do something. He failed to cultivate godly wisdom and instead resorted to worldly and warped wisdom. And that's the sad story of Jephthah, the unlikely leader. In, in the last year, we also heard of many public figures, more than one, okay, more than one public figure are falling away due to charges of infidelity or corruption. As a church, we need to pray for our leaders because only God knows the temptations, the challenges, the pressures they face day in, day out. Now, notwithstanding whether one is Christian or not, none is immune to making wrong decisions. In 2009, Jim Collins wrote a book called When the Mighty Fall. And he was referring to corporations and companies, which nonetheless, I think, is apt for us. It's still good advice for individuals. In his book, he covered five reasons why the mighty fall. And number three is this. Number three is poor decision-making. And this results from what being blindsided by ego, by pride, due to initial success. Over time, we grow in self-confidence and make decisions what based not on data, but based on our own desires. So the solution, he tells us, is humility. When one, when one acknowledges one's mistakes, accepts responsibility for one's role, and is willing to make the necessary changes, that's how we can turn things around. But Jephthah did none of this. He didn't rescind his vow. He blamed his daughter for welcoming him home and he mercilessly deposed of those who opposed him. So if we close this message today, the question I want to ask you, for those of you who are online and those of you on site, the question I want to ask is, do you know God as your covenant keeper? Do you know God as a covenant keeper? Do you know that his love is steadfast? Do you know that His ways are faithful? Do you know that He's your present help? Not just in time of trouble, you know. He's your present help at all times. Can you trust Him to lead, to guide you? Do you seek His counsel before you make your decisions? Don't follow and don't fall into the footsteps of Jephthah. Amen? That's the sermon for today. Now it's time to respond. Worship team, yes. So you've heard the story of Jephthah. You've heard how you know, he, he worked on, um, instead of godly wisdom, instead of godly fear of the Lord, he, how he made decisions was based on how he understood. He re relied on his gifts. He relied on his ability to negotiate. He, re he thought that God would be like anyone, any other gods. And he tried to negotiate with the Lord. So, and he made some serious mistakes. So today, as we come before the Lord, let's let the light of the Holy Spirit search our hearts. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes and ask ourselves, do we really know God as our covenant keeper, as the one who is faithful, as the one who is steadfast? It's not about us, it's about Him. And He will come to rescue us. He'll come to deliver us even though 
we may fail Him at times. And even though we reject Him, God is still the faithful covenant keeper. When we turn to Him, when we seek His way, when we seek His counsel, and when we seek His word. With every head bowed, eyes closed, as we respond to the Holy Spirit, I want to speak to two groups. First group, you've heard about Jephthah and you say, Pastor, I don't want to make the same mistakes. I don't want to live my life just operating on my own wisdom. I don't want to make rash decisions or foolish vows before the Lord. It is not always easy to know what is best because we don't have access to all data points when we make our decisions. Or what will happen tomorrow? That's why we need the fear of the Lord. And you say, Pastor, pray for me that I will be God-fearing in my decisions and I want the Lord to lead and guide me. If that's you, I want you to put up your right hand and just tell the Lord, yes, thank you. I see the right uh, in front. Yes, I see two hands in front. You say, God, I want to make the right decisions for you. I see, yeah, I see your hand up there in the gallery. Thank you for the hand. I say, Lord, yes, thank you for the hand, sister. Thank you, I see that. You say, God, I want your wisdom. I want your counsel. I want to make decisions regarding my life, my family, my career in the way that glorifies you. So that's the first group. We will open the altars as usual. We invite you to come so that we can pray with you as you make that decision. The second group I want to talk to because to be honest, we all have made mistakes in our decision making we all have made poor decisions and you can sympathize and identify with Jephthah in this story Say, Lord I, I too have made some silly decisions but the step that Jephthah didn't take was to come before God to seek forgiveness and to seek God's mercy he didn't know God enough as his covenant maker a covenant keeper enough to entrust himself to him. But today, your story and my story does not have to end tragically. Today, in Christ Jesus, we can find forgiveness, reconciliation, and hope of restoration. And so no one looking around, you say, Pastor, I, I have made some silly mistakes in my life. I have made some mistakes that have led to serious consequences. But today, I want the Lord to take control of my life once again. I want to surrender that part. I want to ask for forgiveness. I want to come before God because I can't right the wrong that I have made. But you can, Lord. You can restore. You can help us. You can redeem. And so, if you are that person, you say, Pastor, pray for me. If there's any of you, just quickly put, yes, sister, I see your right, right hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? You want to come to God and say, Lord, receive me, forgive me, my decisions. Let's all rise. Let's all stand in the presence of the Lord. As the worship team leads us in the song, let's come. The altars are open. Pastors are here. Leaders are here to pray with you. Those of you, you're in the midst of making an important decision, come. Help us pray for the counsel of God, for the will of God. For those of you, you have inadvertently made a mistake make a wrong decision making you also come before God as we commit you to the Lord as well the altar is open come the Lord has spoken to you this is the time for you to respond to God this is the time for you to get right with God God, His arms are always open, ready to receive His precious people. So come as the altar is open right now. Hallelujah. And the rest of us shall we worship the Lord. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for I'm
Thank you, Lord. 